Uh, I'd like to give uh, each member of the uh, panel an opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, share with, with the group uh, what restorative justice means uh, to you and what it looks like within the work that you do in our community. So, Matt? So my name is Matt Fayoya. Uh, I am the restorative coordinator at Clark Middle School. Um, I've been in that role for the past two school years. This is my third school year in that role. Um, before that, I was a science teacher at Clark Middle School for about six years. Um, so I've been in education about 10 years. Um, when I think about restorative justice, what it means to me, um, and I think about the youth that I work with, the sixth through eighth graders that I work with, restorative justice means to me like a, a change, uh, uh, something to, to, to stop the wheel from moving that's been like crushing populations and people in different populations in so many different ways. So it's a start for a new change. That's what restorative justice means to me. And it's amazing to experience that each day at Clark Middle School with students, because we can say, this can stop with you guys. You guys can be that generation. Um, there's one line from a restorative justice worker in California where she talks about um, calling for people to be healers. And I always saw that as incredibly powerful, especially when we're talking about our youth. We're asking for our youth to be healers. We've had a, an environment, a history of so much pain and suffering. Um, and for the first time, I, I feel like in a school system in the U.S., we're trying to get students to understand their role within this community with really implementing positive change um, and healing wrongs um, and making things right and, and showing them the power within that they have. So um, that's what restorative justice means to me. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Danny Malik. I'm the executive director at the Georgia Conflict Center <clears throat> here in Athens. Um, our mission is to ad ad advance restorative practices in the community, um, in, in the schools, in the criminal legal system. Um, so really glad to, to be with everybody here this evening. Um, for me, yeah, I, I, I like uh, what Matt said, and, and really, and particularly around healing. Um, I think building on that, restorative justice is a justice that heals. So if we think, I think our concept of justice has been formed so much by this Eurocentric view of, of criminal justice that really is at it, is most focused on punishment, right, um, or just desserts, paying back somebody for um, harm that they may have caused, where, where restorative justice uh, is rooted in relationships, um, and it's rooted in certain values and principles, values like respect. And so I appreciate you laid that out at the beginning. Whenever we do a restorative process, when Matt does it at Clark Miller, we, do, we first start with values. How do we want to be together? And, and then you can see when we ask that question, it's a consensual uh, process. We're going to decide together how we're going to be. And then principles like um, in inclusion, participation, collaboration, democracy, democratic process. If we sit in circle, not, not one of us has control of, of the outcome of that circle. Together, we're going to decide how to, to go forward. So I think Restorative justice is a way of being. It's also a social movement that is happening around, around the world, rooted in both religious concepts of justice, but also indigenous ways of being from indigenous communities um, in, all over the world. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Robinson. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Juvenile Division at the DA's office. I've been doing juvenile work for probably over 15 years now as a juvenile prosecutor, and um, restorative justice has a, a long history in the juvenile world. Um, I think one of the most important things to me about restorative justice is it gives the victim more of a voice. Of course, we always contact victims and ask them, you know, what do you want to see happen with the case? You know, we keep them up to date, have a lot of conversation with them. But this way they have a direct participation and a direct say in how that's going to be resolved and what exactly, you know, would make them feel more whole out of the situation. 
And the other side to that I think is so important in dealing with teenagers. That's that age where you're still developing empathy and you don't put faces maybe to harm that you've done in the community, like break into somebody's house. That's just a house. You don't really think of that, oh, that's my neighbor, Sarah, down the street, and I see her every day. So it gives more of a face. So maybe, you know, in the future, they can think, you know, these are real people, real harm is coming to the community. So that's what I like about restorative justice. Good evening. I'm David Sweat, and uh, I served as a Superior Court judge in Western Circuit, Athens, Clark, and Oconee Counties from 2002 until I took senior status in 2017 and have served uh, as a senior judge and still uh, handle cases. And uh, I've been do I do a lot of uh, work around mental health advocacy, which I think is very important in, uh, as we address issues arising in particularly the criminal justice system. Uh, I have seen a restorative justice more from afar uh, in superior courts. We have, as, as I was uh, serving, we did not yet uh, developed. I think the, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the discussion because I think that, you know, what is the capacity of our criminal justice system to incorporate in restorative justice techniques, the encounter, the, uh, the accountability, and maybe transformation in connection with an individual. Uh, but the, the encounter piece often in cases that are uh, is not what happens. Uh, we have an encounter in the courtroom. Someone has been uh, injured uh, been, or, or they have lost a loved one. Uh, you know, tragic things. And, and the encounter there is not necessarily intended to be uh, restorative. It's intended to allow the individual to kind of have a voice. But it misses the piece of any uh, connection to the individual who is, uh, a, has committed an offense, and wh whether and how we can incorporate that in uh, implementation of our adult, adult criminal justice system, I think is, uh, you know, I'm hopeful. I mean, we've incorporated other new things, beginning to focus on the underlying reasons that people become involved in the criminal justice system and try, trying to address those. But uh, so I'm I'm kind of in a way an observer. I want to hear more about this because I don't feel as though I know enough, uh, and I'd, I'd like to know more. And I'm I'm hopeful uh, from what I have you know read and studied that we it may it's promising and uh, and appropriate places could be applied uh, to uh, have you know better outcomes for everyone involved. All right, thank you guys. So uh, our next question. Um, and, and, and Judge Sweat, I think you, you, you make a great point there, but we want to talk about what this group sees as the greatest hurdle in uh, implementing uh, restorative justice systems. And, and I'm also interested tonight to, to hear how we balance re restorative justice and accountability as well. So I'll speak for my role in the school. Um, I feel like the hardest thing, to, the biggest hurdle to restorative practices, restorative justice being implemented in schools are the school policies, the district policies on discipline um, that's based in a, a long history of, you know, um, going back to 90, zero tolerance um, and, and just not a lot of openness, a lot, not a lot of opportunity to deal with a particular situation and, and all that comes with that particular situation. Um, and so it's hard to navigate that, um, but I feel like, you know, over the course of my time, um, my five years working with restorative practices, we started at Clark Middle School um, with our contract with GCC, with Georgia Conflict Center, um, and they were able to teach our staff on restorative practices, what it looks like to be a restorative school, how to implement restorative practices. And because of that, we had that buy-in from that administration um, from the beginning. And so that helped. But definitely there was a lot of outside from the district a pushback. And so it was hard to deal with a lot of that. Um, and I think through that, you know, we saw some administrative changes that was pushed by the district. Um, mostly because of our, I think, our commitment to restore the practices. Um, and so um, it was tough to deal with. But I feel like in general we have a, still a strong, supportive, administrative team at Clark Middle School, so that helps. Um, but it, it still is still is a daily pushback um, we're seeing from the district on restorative practices. And, and it's, it's hard to deal with that because 
we're restorative district. We're a restorative district, they say. Um, but there's not a lot of resources put into that. There's not a lot of support put into that um, from the top down. Um, so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would say, you know, one thing that we talk a lot about when we are doing training or, or in restorative work is it, it's about culture change. Um, and so that to me is a big reason why it's challenging because, for instance, the culture in our schools, the culture in our criminal legal system, this has been created over generations, right? Um, and so to, to work to change even pieces of those is going is not going to happen overnight. And we're a culture that demands overnight, uh, outcomes, solutions, um, and we want that measured in the same measurements that we've been measuring the punitive system. And so we talk as well about we ha if, if we're going to create a new way of being together, whether it's in a criminal legal context or in the schools, can we imagine what that might look like? And can we develop new metrics for what restorative justice might look like in the, in the criminal legal system? I mean, still, we can look at recidivism. We can look at... Uh, pub public safety measurements and things like that. But one of the biggest challenges is culture. Ch it, it's about culture change. Another is we, our, our systems and structures are so ingrained. I mean, we, we, have day, we, we have the data that shows that what it costs for a young person to go through a restorative process as a diversion from the juvenile justice system is you know, between 5000 around $5,000 to go through entirely through a restorative justice process versus incarceration, probation, and parole, well over $100,000 for a year for a young person. So we're talking about $5,000 versus 100000 But you can't just divert that money into... Res we're, we've already invested. We've invested in uh, personnel in the Department of Juvenile Justice, in, in the residential facilities, in probation, in parole. So we've got a lot of money, a lot of interest, a lot of vested interest in the way things are. So you, any of you know that go around and try to do some changing in the, in the system, it's not, there's a lot of pushback, as Matt said. Um, and even though we know the way things are, are causing harm, uh, particularly for certain aspects of our community, our, our neighbors. Um, changing it, though, and that's where you're going to start hearing people um, raise, raise voices. I think for our office, um, when working with restorative justice, the biggest hurdle, I think, is um, we need to do more um, community education and outreach. I do emphasize a lot, you know, the benefits to the victims themselves that, you know, you get a say and a lot of the things that are going to happen in the regular legal process can happen in restorative justice. You know, they can do community service and other things like that, which is normally what they would get. It's just a, um, I try to stress, you know, a better way for, um, you know, a victim to get involved and make a difference. But we do have such busy lives, so sometimes that's hard when you're asking people to take, you know, time out of their day after they've already been a victim, you know, to come and, and be part of this process. So I think maybe just more outreach and getting more buy-in um, from the community uh, that so people would want to take that time out and do that. Well, I think it, implementation of restorative justice in our adult, and I'll speak to our adult criminal justice system particularly, is uh, our laws are just not, they don't incorporate that. It's not part of what uh, we start out thinking when we have a, have a, a case that there's uh, you know, an issue that has arisen and someone has been a victim, whether or not it's a property crime and, uh, or if, you know, some kind of a, a personal violence crime. And if we think about what is, uh, you know, we, we, we focus on the individual who committed the offense and we incorporate, if we, as we can, the uh, individual who has experienced the harm. But if the goal is to try and bring about uh, some connection where the uh, victim can feel as though they have uh, been 
that the, the participate in a process where the the individual who committed the offense uh, is, is held accountable and has opportunity to make uh, repairs of, of whatever it is. Um, I think of the cases uh, where uh, individuals, I, I particularly think of a man who has had uh, had a great stamp collection, I mean, albums of stamps, and a person who was uh, drug seeking came in and and you know, stole all the stamp albums, took them down, pawned them for $200, and went and uh, got got uh, substance, you know, drugs. And when, you know, those people came together in court, the, the, the man's life had been sort of taken from him. And the it was what he had, you know, done uh, in his, and it was invested in it. And the individual who had committed the offense had had very little investment in what you know what it what had occurred, and in fact that individual probably was still you know at a point in their life where they were going to continue to be a substance user if there was not some other intervention, and so how what is the repair? How does the repair come into play so that that the victim who has experienced the criminal act is going to uh, to be made whole? Uh, in, in you know, money is part of that, but I think in restorative justice we're looking for something else, which is a reconciliation, and and maybe even change uh, for the uh, for the offender. Uh, but we're the, as uh, as Matt said, I mean, the, and, and 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 Danny, the the culture is just not we're not there in terms of a culture that is going to support restorative justice at this point, and legally it's not. You know, we, we might have to find a way to put it into the code, because if you look uh, at the per criminal procedures, uh, there, there there isn't really a pl there's not a code section that talks about restorative justice, and so how do we start to come up with a a common vision of what that e about what restorative justice is and how it can be applied in you know the the courtroom? Uh, I mean, and think about the volume of cases. Um, you know, there's a, there's always a push to uh, to push through cases, and we've got to resolve them. But there's not necessarily the energy in trying to uh, to to rebuild uh, that that restorative justice. I think uh, seeks, uh, and I, I've just got some. I, I think we're going to have a long way to go, and I think we're going to have to 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 change probably a lot of attitudes uh, along the way. So you, you you took my my next question from me. So <laughs> and you answered it. So good good work. So so what uh, you know I I'm 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 a civil engineer, right? So so hard facts, tangible things. What does restorative justice look like in a very tangible sense? Can you can you give me an example or the group an example of what that really looks like for an individual? Um, I'll start with the Clark Middle view. Um, the process looks like, um, you know, someone, a student or a teacher or an administrator or myself filling out a restorative request form. So it's a form that goes to me, the restorative team, we're able to see it. Um, we're able to pre-conference with the people who are involved in the in the dispute or the conflict. Um, and then from there, we plan the, the circle process. Um, we communicate what happens in the circle with all interested parties. So if it happened in a teacher's classroom, but the teacher wasn't a part of it, we're going to email it to that teacher, that administrator. So everyone's on the same page. Everyone, understand, everyone understands the process, the agreements that the people in the circle came to at the end of the circle. So this is what we're going to do. These are the next steps. Um, and then we've changed it. We used to do 30 days, but um, just with middle schoolers, I think 30 days is a long time. So we're doing 15 days now. So we're checking in 15 days after they had that restorative circle um, just to see how things are going, see if there's any changes that need to be made, if they need to come back together, if they're willing to come back together. Um, so that's what that process looks like. Um, and then what we do um, is we use what we've done throughout the school year. We analyze that. We analyze that. Um, and what's been great is we wouldn't have known to do that without – um, having support from Georgia Conflict Center because they were able to walk us through what does it look like to have a restorative school? 
truly, not just a, a school that like had circles, but truly, structurally, what does it look like to have a restorative school? Um, and through that, we've been able to see that we do need some sort of data. We do need some sort of way of proving that this is effective. And so we've been able to have um, quarterly, mid-year, and end-of-year um, uh, just, uh, I guess we'd call them just a summation of everything that's happened that school year. Um, we go over like the changes we've seen, um, the data, how it's looking. I um, mean, one of the big things we focused on and we saw a big, a big huge issue and was in disproportionality of data. So the amount of African American black students that are being referred, suspended, we're seeing it's, it's just crazy numbers. Um, and so we were able to just understand that um, and see if that's having any type of impact. So we're able to see this, this data is proving that this is effective. Um, we're able to look at referral um, data. And in particular, what we're looking at are things that are subjective. So when we're talking about referrals, teachers can write referrals for lots of different things. Um, and then there's the, there's the base things. There's like a kid brought a cigarette to school. A kid fought. There's no other way of going about that. But when we're looking at the subjective things, the things like um, uh, this kid was disrespectful, um, this kid was disruptive, we talk about that. We look at that data and we say, these are subjective things. This is down to a breakdown in communication between the adult in that room and the student or students. How can we understand that breakdown? I think it's through restorative practices, understanding where students come from, understanding that there needs to be healing and conflict, and, and truly an understanding of each individual in that role. Um, and so uh, that's how it looks like at a school. I, I, hopefully that broke it down, but um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, and, and maybe Amber uh, can talk more about, so we, Georgia Conflict Center has a formal partnership with the district attorney's office, DA Gonzalez and I, well, DA Gonzalez convened a, a working group of systems partners for about a year and a half, um, folks from Department of Juvenile Justice, judges, public defender's office, others from the community, and out of that came a formal partnership where now um, the DA's office can, and, and really Amber as the a juvenile assistant uh, district attorney can, can choose, uh, um, after speaking with the victim, can choose to make a referral to uh, the Georgia Conflict Center. And what that means is that case is being diverted from the traditional channels of prosecution. Um, so first, I'll let Amber talk more about what happens before we get the referral. But once we get the referral, similar to what Matt just described, um, but but it probably a bit we 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 take a good bit more time than Matt is able to. By the way, Matt facilitated about 500 of these restorative circles last year, and that's what the data from Clark Central uh, shows. So, yeah. Matt and others, including students, Matt and others and students, uh, lots of folks involved, but over 500 restorative circles at Clark, Clark Middle School. That's, that's culture change there. So uh, in, the, in the juvenile justice system here, when we get a referral, our next step is also we're going to reach out to the victim first. This is a victim-centered process. We want to get a sense from them, um, their, their experience, what do they feel like they need out of this process, what was the impact on them? What would they like to see happen in a restorative process? Um, so kind of going through similar questions that we will eventually address in a restorative process. In, uh, we call it a restorative conference in the criminal legal sense. Um, and so reach out to the victim. We, we also speak to the person that caused the harm and meet with them to understand as well what happened. Um, understand, are they really ready to take responsibility uh, for the harm that they caused? And what do they think they could possibly do to make things better? And so that, that process could go, you know, back and forth, meeting individually. Also, are there, you know, to the victim, is there somebody you would like to invite to be a part of this process? Could be a family member, somebody, your pastor, somebody from the community. Um, and, and so if they have some folks they would like to be involved, we need to speak to them, go through the same process to prepare them for the restorative process. 
Um, same on the other side with the person that caused harm. We have an additional partnership, which I'm very excited about, with Juvenile Offender Advocate. That is a, an organization here in town that works specifically with uh, young folks who are going through the, the criminal legal system. Um, and so we are, for half the cases that we've taken so far, we've partnered uh, the youth with an advocate essentially a mentor, somebody that's going to accompany them, and we've included them in the restorative process because they're going to keep working with that young person well beyond the restorative process. So a lot of preparation, like Matt said, really the key to this working well is the preparation. Are there any red flags? Are there needs um, for resources? I heard uh, Judge Sweat mention mental health. Are When we're hearing those things, we at Georgia Conflict Center are not prepared, but we need to be prepared to connect with providers, uh, mental health providers, substance abuse providers. Is there a housing need? Is there other needs that may have contributed to this situation from happening? So I really appreciate when uh, Judge Sweat mentioned, or maybe it was you, Amber, getting to the root. The, these restorative processes if they're going to go well, we're going to get to the root of why this happened, and we're going to work on addressing that in a strengths-based way as much as possible. We really want to, when, when I'm doing a restorative process, I almost always start by asking the others in the circle if they know each other, so often in schools, what strength do you see in Matt? You know, if Matt's your teacher, what, what strength do you see in him as a teacher? And Matt, what strength do you see in the student? Because we want the, the outcome, the agreements to be rooted in our strengths. Um, and so if it seems appropriate to move forward with the restorative process, then we would organize a, a, a time to come together. It would be a facilitated discussion um, that everybody has agreed to. They know what we're going to be talking about. Um, and I, me as the facilitator would already have a pretty good idea of what folks would like to see happen out of this. Um, we, we talk through what happened. We talk about the impact on people. Um, people speak for themselves about how they've been impacted. And then we work together on a, on a plan to make things better. We call it a restorative plan that's documented. That plan is documented. Everybody signs off on it. And then the last responsibility of the facilitator, whether this is in school or in the criminal legal context, is to follow up and make sure that people are doing what they committed to doing. In the criminal legal context, if that doesn't happen, if somebody violates the agreement or commits to doing some sort of community service and they don't do it, um, and, you know, I might work with them to get them back on track, but if it doesn't happen, then we can refer the, we will refer the case back to the district attorney's office to decide how to proceed, whether that's prosecution or some other uh, mechanism. But all that that happens in the restorative realm is 100% confidential. We don't, we don't pass any of that information on to the DA's office um, just to protect due process and, and things like that. So I'll just... Leave that. So I'm at the very beginning of the process. So cases come into my office. I review them first. You know, if there's a victim, then there's a process I go through to look at the the history of the offender. Um, some offenders are just not going to be right for the process because maybe they're already on probation. I already know they don't have a lot of family support and things like that that are going to help them get through the process because I think that's a big part of it. You have to have your parents on the parents on board because they're going to go through this process uh, with the minor as they go through it. Um, so then if, if the person looks like a good candidate. The next thing we do is call the victim, explain restorative justice to them, ask them what they would like to see done with the case and if they would be interested in having us pursue that. And if they're on board with the restorative justice program, then um, all this happens prior to any case being formally charged. So then I will reach out to the parent of the minor and have a meeting with the parent and the child and explain the process to them and see, you know, do you want to take responsibility or do you want a trial? Because I don't want anybody, you know, who says, oh, no, I didn't do this. Then you have to go through the formal process. 
um, because it's all about taking responsibility. And and once we establish that they're ready to do that, we have a contract that we go over that just kind of goes over what's expected during the process, what kind of behaviors are, you know, allowed and not allowed in in the process and how the case might come back to us and confidentiality and all that. And then we send it over to Mr. Danny Malik, and he takes it from there. Well, I'm afraid I don't have any concrete examples of, of, of restorative justice being employed. Uh, you know, in, and I think in some ways, we may do it in small ways. We, we may do it in small ways uh, when we create an environment in the courtroom where uh, the, uh, the victim can, can speak to, to the uh, offender and can, uh, you know, hopefully communicate in a way the harm that they've caused. And sometimes, you know, the the individual will ex- experience some, uh, you know, can, will, will express some concern or would recognize the harm that they've caused. But I think, um, you know, I, I can't really, other than, you know, trying in, and I think of the difficult cases where there's been a, uh, a loss of life, uh, and you have a, a family that's there, and, and uh, you know they've lost a loved one, and you know what can be said there by the uh, the to to try and create or, or restore uh, relations. It's a that's a hard one, and you know some of my you know, knowledge about uh, restorative justice was from sixty minutes. I mean they've done some shows on it, and. It, it looked like in those kind of cases, it takes years. It's not something that is done uh, like in the, in the space of, uh, of, of a short time. It, it may take years. And you can understand that when there's been someone who's experienced a tremendous loss as a result of, uh, you know, of, of, of an individual's conduct. I'm encouraged to hear that we're talking about implementation of this in, in schools because I think that the earlier that children can understand the effects that their behaviors may have on others and to take account for that it, it may help us you know down further downstream because a lot of times by the time uh, someone gets into a superior courtroom uh, there's they may have been through the juvenile justice system they and they may have all of the the things that make uh, contribute to criminality as, as Danny was talking about, whether it's homelessness, whether it's uh, uh, mental, uh, uh, you know, behavioral health uh, disorders or substance abuse disorders, and those are things that you know you it, you kind of have to address those things before someone is going to be in a position to accept responsibility and and create some sort of, of, of transformation or or some sort of connection to someone whom they have have, have injured. So I, I'm you know I think it's. I think there's promise in that, but I think we're going to see it go slowly. But I'm very glad to see that we're starting because I think we we can know that there are a lot of children in our schools who are going to wind up in our criminal justice system, and if the more we can do at that level to to prevent their their journey, uh, the the you know, the better our our Athens will be. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So um, I'm going to start on the other end of the table this time, if that's okay. So, um, uh, you know, if we look down the road, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, how do we how do we measure the results of restorative justice? And Judge Sweat or Amber? Yeah. Well, I think for us, the way we would measure the results is a decrease in recidivism. Because I want to see that if I send a minor to the restorative justice program, that's the last we see of them. They go to the program and and that flips something, you know, in their mind that like, nope, I want to go away from this. And and they're, you know, a law abiding citizen from that point point on. So, I mean, that's that's the only way I can think of how we would measure that. Um, I, I think uh, uh, f- that question would be best posed to folks who have not experienced this community as just or equitable, uh, members of the Athens-Clark County community that would feel that 
they've experienced injustice both in schools and in the in the criminal legal system and so i think yeah certainly recidivism but also how 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 well are we doing with rooting these ways of if it's a way of being if it's a culture how are we doing with um introducing it and sharing it in communities so that communities feel that they have a tool to solve problems together uh, to, rather than having to go to the police. We can, we, we've got a conflict, we can, we can work this out. So, so communities empowered to solve their own problems. Uh, I think our willingness to address historical harm at a community level in this community, you know, working in the schools um, so often, when, say, some students get into a fight or something, parents come in, they're like, oh my God, that's where ISS was when I was here 30 years ago. And for them, they tell, they tell you about their experience in the school, and it wasn't good. And, and so here it is, the next generation uh, is, is having some challenges. So recognizing the historical harm in the community, are we, are we ready to, are we open to uh, creating space where those who have been harmed um, can name that and and can be part of uh, deciding how do we address that moving forward. If we're going to talk about restorative justice, that that's a foundation that I think has to be uh, part of it. Um, I think kind of echoing what you said, Danny, um, but going, I guess, more particular is for me, the biggest thing that I want to see is equitable outcomes for our students. We don't have equitable outcomes for our students right now in Clark County, throughout the nation, but especially Clark County. Um, and that being behavioral or academic. And so we're looking at equitable outcomes. We're looking at the same, the same responses for negative behaviors in the classroom, which we're not seeing. We're not seeing the same responses from teachers. Um, and I think that goes deep with, with training with staff, which is, goes into what everybody's been talking about. Restorative justice takes time. And through that time, I mean, we don't have teacher training programs for school, for, for, for students who are learning to be teachers in college. There aren't a lot of programs that really talk about restorative justice. They really talk about socio emotional support for students. Um, and, and understanding students where they come from. There's not a lot of that. And so when we think about that, we think about, that it has to start way back, way back. It has to go foundationally back. And it's going to take time. Um, but, yeah, I think overall it's the equitable outcomes for students, um, the amount of time students are in OSS, ISS, not because, you know, I can look at a student. I can, I can know the demographic of a student. If that student is black, the student's going to have a lot more chance of being in OSS, ISS. That's just facts. That's stats. Um, and so, um yeah, in 20 years' time, if I know restorative has been successful, is when we have those equitable outcomes for all our students. You know, on a, a community basis, I think one of, not just individual restorative justice, one of the things that we are going to have to struggle with is the uh, all of the injustice that was done in pursuit of the war on drugs. Uh, and if we look at what... Uh, I think we now hopefully understand more about uh, the underlying reasons, but if we compare our response to the opioid crisis and recognition that uh, the in individuals uh, were experiencing a, you know, a physiological uh, condition, and we look at our response to the uh, crack epidemic, I mean. There was that's vastly different, vastly different, uh, and I think there, you know, there's a lot. You know, you mentioned mistrust in the community. I can understand. I, I think there's a lot of things got done, and a lot of people lived in fear and may still live in fear because of uh, of, of some of the things that were done in in pursuit of what was was you know really a, an assault on. A lot of people's rights as they uh, were. If we had chosen to deal with it differently, we might have had some different outcomes. But that's sort of a, a community kind of thing. I mean, what is it that is that will re restore the connections and relationships amongst people, particularly where they have been, you know, destroyed uh, in in ways that were, were where there was vast racial disparity in in the outcomes. So. Thank you, guys. I would uh, 
I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to to ask questions. So, uh, yes, ma'am. At the beginning, I think uh, Danny uh, mentioned some of the indigenous practices. Um, are there any examples you guys are using, uh, using those uh, restorative justice uh, practices from indigenous populations? Yeah, um, so, and I don't know if you want to talk about it. So the, the thing that we haven't talked about a lot is we've been talking about it in a restorative justice in a responsive way. But uh, what we emphasize in schools and, and what uh, Matt, I think, really also at Clark Middle, for instance, is um, using these same practices to build community. And so in the schools, we teach the circle process and we use the talking piece uh, this process was was um, taught by indigenous communities in in the U.S. and in in Canada, but also uh, the Maori community in in New Zealand. Actually, the uh, New Zealand was the first uh, country to uh, you, you talked about codifying into law in 1989. Uh, they codified restorative pra restorative justice practices into law in the juvenile system in New Zealand, and part of that was be because the Maori people said we, you know, they, at that time they were about 20 percent of the population, but they were almost 80 percent of the prison population, and you may see some parallels to our country. The Maori people said this Western justice system is not serving our families or our communities. And there was a whole movement that led to um, the, the law being passed in 1989. So now all juvenile cases are done in circle using uh, culturally uh, practices that, that the people that are participating bring from their own cultures. Um, so we, we do... Uh, we. Um, use the circle process in schools. Um, we are working to train folks in the community to use that in the communities in, in uh, Athens as well. Um, really to focus first on the, the proactive building community, creating space for dialogue, for democratic decision making. Because um, then, this is what we say in schools, then when we have a problem, well, let's circle up. Let's, we have this process. We have this practice that we use here, and then it doesn't feel so punitive. It doesn't feel foreign even because this is what we do um, at Clark Middle at every in advisement they, they circle up. Same at Clark Central. Um, and I'll just point out, we're just mentioning a few schools in Clark County because I, there's only a few schools in Clark County that are doing anything with restorative justice. Um, I know this isn't really like on the question topic, but it is so important to me in my work that that starts in the schools because I can be responsive to things that happen, but the prison to, the school to prison pipeline is a very real thing. And if we can start changing that in the school setting and dealing with those things in the school, I want to see my cases drop. And then I think when we start with young people and we start in the schools, then that's where we're going to really see our community change because we're starting with them. So I just, the work you guys do is so important. And hopefully, I'm really hoping you said looking to the future that my caseload just drops off because we have this going on in the schools. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, I, you know, I think even those of us who are not acquainted with this yet, that restorative justice is really new to our system. It's non-traditional. Uh, there are challenges. So what I'm really wondering, and you've heard bits and snatches, this, the change implies involvement on the part of the courts, law enforcement, schools, the district attorney's offices, and probably other agencies. So my question is, what is the status currently, the state legislature, what is the status of the dialogue with and among these various concerned parties about restorative justice. And it's a two-part question. The other question is, in that multi-conversation, what is being used to sell the idea that restorative justice is a desirable and a positive and even a necessary 
new element in dealing with conflict resolution. Does everybody understand the question? Someone would like to take it. Well, my answer would be short for the, the juvenile side because our juvenile system is kind of built around this kind of idea. When they redid the juvenile statutes in Georgia, it became more um, child-centered, a child-centered focus. What can we do to help this child to turn them away from the system that they're in and you know get them help so they're not repeat offenders? And so restorative justice is well received um, by the courts in Clark County. They're supportive of it. And, you know, we have it in our office. Um, so I think the, the question more would be on an adult level or in the schools, because we're, you know, the only, I guess, hurdle is um, I have to sell it to victims and, you know, the public in general to get a buy-in there. But, you know, we're ready and we keep, you know, trying, so. One one thing that's encouraging, and this is in the last, uh, within the end of July, the National Judicial College, which is uh, a training resource for uh, state court judges uh, like myself around the country, had what I think was its first restorative justice conference. And so, you know, there at least is maybe the beginning of a dialogue of how restorative justice can become incorporated uh, in, into our, ju our, our justice system, but I think it's a beginning, and I don't think that the, the, there is, you know, nationally there are tribal courts where that is more used, and maybe there, and certainly there are efforts around to try and create restorative justice, but I was encouraged that it was becoming more uh, a subject matter which uh, the, the judicial college thought should be, uh, you know, should be a part of, uh, you know, a discussion and how we can create uh, and begin a discussion of, of implementing a restorative justice as appropriate. It's been a long day, so I want to make sure I understand the second part of your question. The second part of your question was, how do we sell it in general, restorative practices? The second part of the question is, in order to make a change, you've got to demonstrate uh, something, that the current system isn't working, that the new approach presents new potential for a better outcome, you have to sell why this approach should be something that people should buy into and support. And when I say people, I mean people like state legislators. I mean, we all know there is a tension across this country and in this state between people who have radically different approaches to criminal justice. We see that in the legislature. We see that among different district attorney offices. My suspicion, my conjecture, is that this is another element of friction, this kind of radically new and different approach to dealing with conflict. And I guess I can't really speak on a on a bigger scale other than at my school. But what we do to sell it amongst teachers, staff, administrators is that what you said. What we've been doing for hundreds of years in the American school systems isn't working. It's not working, um, and we can see that through the data. We can see that through our academic behavioral outcomes. So we try to say the punitive ways we've dealt with things has led to this. And so what can we go back to that's incredibly human, that works to have effective, working, positive classrooms? That's what we have to sell it to the teachers, because teachers want effective, positive, working classrooms where they're able to have relationships with students and those students are able to do the work for them and, and everything's positive and cheery and everybody's high five and then all that. And that happens. That has happened in our schools, right? We, we have, we've had those experiences with our teachers. We know that. So point to that and understanding that Thinking about it from a structural point of view is radical, but really thinking about it from an individual point of view, it's not radical. It's, it's, it's community. It's humans, being humans. And for some reason, when we step into, I know when we step into a court, when we step into the classroom, things change. Things get a little bit more tight, and we don't see those students, those 20 students as individuals. It's how can I survive? How can I get that, that standard taught? How can I do all those other things? And we're trying to say that foundationally, if you adhere to restorative practices, then all those things will fall in line. 
Um, so that's how we try to sell it. Um, we both at the same time. I've got one kind of a follow up question that's similar to the second question that he had, and, and it's about how your allies, it's wonderful the culture, the, the idea that you're using kindness, compassion, and cultural sensitivity to, to transform a system that's broken. But, but how can you have your allies help you convince a society that seems much more bent on anger and hatred now? Than kindness and compassion. As far as for youth in the community, um, restorative justice has been around for a very long time. Um, I've been in juvenile justice for over 15 years, and, and when I first started in the field, um, we had some restorative uh practices going on in different jurisdictions. And there's a lot of research out there um, that just, it says it works and says it's a uh, victim, uh, victims are happier, recidivism is down. They, they have studies for each community that have put those practices together to build on. Um, so that's just where I would have to, you know, I just got to show them the numbers and say, this works. We've seen it in different communities that have tried it and it worked. So, I mean, I think that's always the best way is, is scientific process, I guess. Yeah, I, w I would just emphasize going back to your question, we do need more empirical research. I think there is a good bit of, uh, there's emerging more research and evidence. And if you go to Georgia Conflict Center's website, you can see we have a lot of the, the latest research that's out there on there. But we need more empirical uh, evidence about this, um, particularly in schools. A lot of what we see in schools is they're evaluating um, culture change or, or you know impact on this, the system after one or two years of implementation, and that that's just not enough time. We're, we're looking at changing uh, things that are are broken in our schools that have been that way for, as Matt said up to hundreds of years. And so we're, we, if you, you have the expectation that that's going to change in that short amount of time. And, and some of what we want to measure is, is more uh, qualitative as well. So let's make sure that we're getting feedback from students, from families uh, about their experience. Um, and uh, Mr. Priest, right? Yeah, your, your question... Um, can you say it again? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's really this, it's really the same question, but it's about how to utilize your allies to convince people who are much more interested in anger and hatred than kindness and compassion. But this is, and I like the idea of hard. I mean, I come from a profession of hard facts and and, and evidence based uh, things, so I like that idea. But are there other ways? Can recruit allies to help you sell this overall concept. So, in my experience of doing this for you know 15 years or so in the community and school, the best way is to invite people into restorative processes. And so, I think it's our responsibility, at Georgia Conflict Center, to be doing this more in the community, training folks. We're working with the neighborhood leaders now to train all the neighborhood leaders. In, in my experience, when I worked in schools, the best way to build buy-in was to invite folks. Oh, you're having a challenge with that student? Why don't we sit sit together in a restorative process? And and you know, I think some the biggest impediment there it would be the ego, um, because for instance, in the school, if you're asking an adult to sit in a restorative process with a student, well, but I'm the adult, you know, I shouldn't have to. Do, so then it's probably not going to work. But if if you can invite folks and they're willing to, and so I think with that anger and rage, like. You come and sit in a restorative process, it kind of, it, it has the potential to melt um, because of how the process is facilitated, the, the values and the principles of the process. And I'll just echo that. I mean, that's, we, um, our restorative culture leadership team for Clark Middle School met during the summer, the, the plan for this upcoming, this current school year. Um, and that was one of the big things we wanted to focus on was having more um, parents, families coming in and experiencing um, restorative circles because there is a positive impact. A lot of times parents will come into a situation. I get that. I have, I have kids. They got into a fight. 
got hurt, something happened to them, I would come in with my hands like this. But by the end, everyone's shaking hands. And we've had really, really, really contentious circles with family members coming in, threatening to sue or whatever. And I can't think of a time that people haven't left feeling positive um, and shaking hands and hugging and just positivity. So I think actually experiencing the circles. I have a, I have a question. One of the the challenges that I think is most uh, uh, frightening in Athens is that we have uh, individuals who are connected to each other through gang relate. We call it gang relationships. I'm not sure that's the right term. And there is there seems to be uh, a lot of intergroup violence that it and you know people that are. Uh, not involved or getting uh, injured. And I, I don't know how you do that. I've, I've certainly, you know, there are uh, places around the country where there has been intervention in into gang situations. Um, at one of, and I, I wonder, you know, is there something that we could do here that, that might try to reconcile some of this so we don't have the kind of uh, just street violence uh, that, you know, is, 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 is so dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you're right. There are other models that, that we can look to around the country. One of them is how to, how do we, um, empower folks that have been through either gangs or through the, in, been incarcerated and, and find ways to plug them back in um, to helping the community and mentoring those young folks. They, in, in my line of work, they call those folks credible messengers. I would not be one. I have not served time. I'm not, I wasn't formally, I've worked with lots of youth and gangs, but how do we, in Athens, uh, find ways to employ, pay, pay fairly and justly folks that have been through those systems to help mentor others. And th that's one aspect. The other aspect is, is the violence intervention. How do we help interrupt when something happens? How do we help, you know, interrupt? And there are models um, of, of that as well that I think we could learn from. That, that answer your question? Uh, third row back. I think you had a question. You mentioned that not all schools in Clark County were in the restorative justice model. And so I'm wondering, are you comparing your data with those schools that are not in the restorative justice programs? We're not consistently looking at that data. Um, but that's something that we definitely should start doing. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if the board would call the district. District. I didn't know the board, if the district would allow that. It's definitely readily available. And that's like my wheels are already turned and I'm thinking about looking at that. And we, I mean, we know just anecdotally that certain students are less successful at other middle schools and then they come to us and we're able to figure out something, work out something for them. So, um, but yeah, that's, yeah, definitely. I, I'll just say that the work at Clark Middle and at Clark Central um, were both pilots that were started by the school district. And so I think your question would be a great one for the school district. What have they learned from these pilots? What are they choosing to do with the money they've invested over the last five years in these pilots? Because um, I'm not sure it's real clear to the community what the next steps are, or is the district going to uh, be doing more uh, restorative work, or have they decided they don't want to? Um, but I think it's really important to, to be able to make that comparison. Um, so this is a small district. We should be able to have a sense. Um, in comparison at Clark Middle versus some of the other schools, what what uh, changes have we seen with the restorative work? And I think you should share this in PTA well, and that would be one way to, to get this out to other people in the community. I'm glad you mentioned that. We actually are. We have a September CMS PTA meeting. We're operating circles, and so that should be a good experience for uh, parents um, to actually experience the circles. 
Um, sidebar, I want to shout out Miss Larson. I'm going to call you out because her granddaughter was one of our, our peace leaders. So there's a group of eighth grade students. We had 16 eighth grade students who were actually trained in restorative practices and led restorative circles. Um, and if you could just see the work that like her granddaughter and like all the other students did, I mean, they... Me and the other restorative coordinator at the time, Ms. Foot, we would have to go back to drawing board. We're like, man, they're, they're doing it right. They're taking the time. They're, they're really asking great questions, leading great circles, planning it out. Um, and just that's the power of restorative practices and the future for restorative practices so that you guys see less. Um, cause we're having, we're, we're training up 14 year olds who are leaders who are able to have restorative circles and mentor 11 year olds and, and want a positive, peaceful, outcome from conflict, which is incredibly powerful. I compare myself to being 14 years old. I wouldn't have the capacity to do that. But those kids definitely, definitely do. And it's, it's amazing to see. But again, that takes time because I know, for instance, I know that some people want to replicate that program at their schools, which is cool, which is great. But how do we do that without adult support, without adults who are actually trained to restore the practices? That's the key. I couldn't have done that six years ago with that group of students. But because I was trained in the restorative practices, they have adults who support them and engage in restorative practices, those students could learn and, and be supported. Um, so that's key. Awesome. So I'd like to take uh, one more question. I have two ones real short. Okay. Uh, is in the middle school and the circles, is that also confidential? What's that there? Yeah, we try to keep it confidential. Um, we want to make it a safe space for students, um, but there also are youth, so we want to make sure that, like, you know, if I'm going to share this information with their parent guardian, then I'll let them know that it's out in the open. Um, if I'm going to share information with teachers, it's with a purpose. We want to still support you guys. You guys are still 12 or 13 years old, so, like, maybe you do need that support from Mr. Smith in your math class because you have that issue with that student in that class. So I'm going to email him your agreements that you came out to. But for the most part, they are confidential. Um, and that was, again, another powerful thing and the maturity shown from that group of students who led circles. Those students did not talk about it. We checked. We knew. They did not talk about it. They checked each other. They make sure that what happened in the circle stays in the circle. That's our big thing that the kids know. Um, and so, and I think that speaks to the power of the circle. If you know all the information is going to be shared out, of course, you're not going to buy in. Um, so that was key. Uh, the other question I had was, uh, and kind of a bigger thing for the district, and I think there's a lot of things going on with uh, the justice outside of the very center. Uh, would you comment a little bit on that scope? I do know that um, what I do know is that like two years ago, the district um, went with another company um, that engages in restorative practices, trains in restorative practices. And then this past school year, we different people who might have stakes in it were trained in some of these through a quick um, session. And I, and through that quick session, the idea was that we would take that information, that three or four hours of information, and then train other adults within our building. But there is no directive on how or when. Um, and again, restorative practices takes time um, to be restoratively trained. Um, through GCC, it took eight to 10 sessions, hour long sessions, um, a, a long process. Um, so, um, and that's where I know we're at right now. But as far as we are, again, a quote unquote, a restorative district, but um, I don't see a lot of like structures put in to really support that. Yeah. So, so uh, before we leave tonight, uh, what we'd like to know is what each of you see as the path forward in restorative justice from your perspective. Um, I think the path forward, and again, I'm gonna stick strictly. I'm gonna stick strictly to Athens Clark County is honesty. We gotta have start having a lot of honest conversations. This community um, is an incredible community, but it's a community where there hasn't been a lot of honesty amongst different demographics, different groups, different incomes. There hasn't been a lot of honesty, and once we can start to have that those honest conversations, um, I think 
then we can we can see some progress and that's what the powerful thing about it is um about restorative practices and, and doing it from a middle school up is that these are our future community leaders these are the people who are going to be running things in our community and so when they can when we can go and have conversations about racial inequality when we can talk about linen town um when we can talk about just violence. We can talk about just deep things that, again, as a 13, 14 year old, I wasn't having those conversations. Teachers weren't supporting us with having those conversations, and now we are. And so I just think there's a lot of power in this group of students. Gen Z, they're just, they're special. They're different. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it's the internet or what, TikTok or what, but just I think exposure to different, different cultures. Again, there's negativity with that, but there's a lot of positivity with that. And I feel like these, these, this youth is incredibly open, incredibly, um, accepting of others. And, um, and I hear them have honest conversations. And so I think we can like model what we do off them. I would say uh, we need to, one, celebrate where it's happening. I want to celebrate the work of, of Matt. But also, if you see Dr. Gorham, the uh, principal at Clark Middle, thank her for her commitment. She didn't necessarily have to, when she started just two years ago, uh, keep that going, and she has. Thank Dr. Huff at Clark Central. They've been, uh, you know, Matt and these folks have been leaders of this work, um, and it's not easy to stick your neck out on the, and, and, and do something different. I also want to celebrate lots of work that's happening in this community that we don't even call restorative. I see uh, Sheriff John Q there and a lot of work that they're doing to prepare folks that are coming back to the community after a time of incarceration, in my mind, is restorative work, helping folks come back in a better way than when they went in into there. So celebrating the work that's about healing, that's about building community. Um, we don't have to use the language, but but that's what restorative work is, building respect, building a, a space of dialogue um, and celebrating, uh, yeah, other leaders. I know D.A. Gonzalez right, from day one promoted restorative justice, and that has been a, a big challenge for D.A. Gonzalez. So we, can, we, need to, we need to celebrate where it's happening, support it, and, and have a long-term perspective. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, one thing that I have uh, learned in my many years working in the juvenile system is a lot of problems start at home with communication between parents and teenagers. And I hadn't really, before we started the program here, thought about um, sending parents and um, kids to the restorative justice program, but it makes a lot of sense. I, I have a lot of experience with um, accountability courts, and one of, I think, the most beneficial thing I've seen out of those is at the end, the ones who are successful, they and their parents talk about how much better they communicate at home and how their relationship has improved through the process. And I've started looking at the restorative justice process as a place where all the things they can meet, they can communicate, they can figure out a plan of how to get along better in the future. And I think we can cut off a lot of issues, you know, for future criminal behavior if we can send some of those issues over to the restorative process. Uh, restorative program and get parents and kids talking. So that's, I'm looking to the future. I'm looking at more of those cases and sending those over and hoping that's going to have a really positive impact. Well, I think we're, for particularly the adult criminal justice system, it's, it's going to take a while. Uh, I would say this in 2001, uh, we didn't know what accountability courts were. I mean, people weren't employing the type of, uh, uh, more skillful responses to the think to the reasons that people came into contact with the criminal justice system, and so it took a while. And early on, there was a lot of resistance to that. Uh, judges that uh, felt like uh, they were being social workers and put in a role that was not judicial. But I think that those uh, who participated realized that they could use their authority as a judicial figure to move people on a path toward wellness. And I think. Uh, Similarly, uh, in the civil context, there was uh, 25 years ago, uh, mediation was a new concept uh, that, where people would sit in the room with a, uh, you know, a skilled or neutral person, skilled neutral person, and uh, 
try and resolve uh, their differences, whether it was a, a dispute in a family law matter or uh, some other civil dispute. But And now that's become a routine part of our civil justice system. It, and it, we know that it, it resolves matters. So I think that the, this is going to be a long, uh, long process. And uh, starting by recognizing uh, you know, that it exists, because I'm, I'm sh not sure that if you were to talk to, uh, uh, you know, how many legislators have even uh, heard of restorative justice. And I think there's a lot of education. And I think we're going to, if we're going to, I think employing it in the juvenile setting is, is most crucial. Uh, I think maybe we can begin to learn how to employ it. Uh, in uh, the with adult uh, individual adult offenders, but it's it's going to take a while. And uh, you know, I'm encouraged to hear what the sheriff, and I know what the sheriff is doing to try and create uh, the the potential for people you know people to to re to return and not and have more skills. In in, but I think the the process if we if we value restorative justice, and I think that's a question that is a you know, community we may have to answer is to how do we, how are we going to value this and put resources to it? Because it takes, as I understand, it takes time and people have to be patient with it. It's not, I mean, I can sentence somebody and, you know, have their case finished in 30 minutes. But if you're going to try and resolve something through uh, the restorative means, it's going to take a lot more time. And, and, and uh, that, that may be something that we have to, uh, to, to get support for. And, and create a vision of what it can do to, to improve uh, Athens and, and our, our larger community. Anything else the panel would like to say before we... No? Well, no. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, definitely, absolutely appreciate uh, your empathy and care for our community and uh, for participating tonight and for everything that you do. Thank you very much. Yeah.